Okay. All right, okay. so yeah. let's start. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is quadrilateral security dialogue, strategic relevance. So, trying to move the slide. So, a little bit about Council for Strategic Affairs. Council for Strategic Affairs imparts education in the field of international relations. It fosters discussion, dialogue, and debate on geopolitical issues. It encourages strategic studies in general to raise the awareness, and it aims to contribute to world peace and prosperity. So let's discuss what are our activities. We do have a monthly roundtable discussion. It is scheduled every third Monday. Uh, uh, third Monday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That is a standard time. We have once a month a guest lecture by a domain expert. We have organized in the past symposia, meetings, and conferences, and we promote publications of articles on geopolitics and related subjects. So, Today's roundtable discussion is on quad, and the way we will have this entire event would be that I will introduce the topic. After the topic is introduced, we will have some discussion, question answers. We aim to finish within one hour time. So let's start with what is quad. It depends upon who answers this question. There was a time people who have been there, but then Quad meant a loose trading block of four entities, basically United States, Canada, European Union, and Japan. That was in 1990s. Uh, however, that Quad lost its relevance in 2001 when China was allowed to join the WTO. Uh, because everyone had to then trade under the rules of WTO, so the old quad dissipated. I think you may, at least in the current environment, especially after the virtual summit of the head of, uh, head of governments on Friday, March 12th, hear a number of terms, quad 1.0, quad 2.0, quad plus, we will discuss all these issues as we go along. So Quad 1.0, basically this was a loose grouping of four countries, Japan, India, Australia, and US. So this is the gentleman who was the brain behind the Quad. This is Shinzo Abe, two times Prime Minister of Japan. And he really worked hard to make Quad a success, and we shall discuss as we go along. If you see this slide, uh, the four countries that constitute the Quad, India, Australia, Japan, and US. And Shinzo Abe defined it as a democratic security diamond. So you see that here it is in diamond shape, you know, with, if you see the globe. He also described it as a confluence of two oceans and an arc of democracies while giving a speech in Indian parliament in 2007. And this is the timeline of Quad. It started accidentally. In 2004, on the Boxing Day, there was a huge tsunami in the Indian Ocean. Hundreds and thousands of people died in the tsunami. And as a result of tsunami, where pretty much most of the littoral states, small states, were overwhelmed, 
some countries started to do altruistic humanitarian assistance and disaster relief work. And in that process, this tsunami core group was formed of Australia, India, Japan, and US. So December 2004, January, February of 2005, once they did the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, they started to work together in May of 2007, a working group meeting was held in Manila. I already talked about Chindo Abe's speech in Indian parliament. In September of 2007, India used to have, India still has the naval exercises, bilateral naval exercises, Malabar exercises in the US. So in 2007, uh, India invited Japan as well as Australia in these maritime exercises. And in 2007, Singapore also joined in the Malabar exercises. That was the formal sort of, you know, opening of quad one, but in February, 2008, it died. Australia's foreign minister while visiting China stated in a press conference that they would not be proposing to have the dialogue of that nature in future ever. So this slide actually tells you what I just told you. What is interesting that this Asian tsunami in Indian Ocean happened these countries, the four countries that were doing rescue and recovery and humanitarian assistance did invite China to help in the recovery process. And China refused at that point in time. But after the Quad grouping was formed in 2007, China got very upset and sent their hardships to all the four Quad countries. And of course, in 2008, Australia pulled out of Quad. It's very important that sometimes international relations are driven by personalities, not by national interests. Kevin Rudd is a labor politician from Australia, and he is an Anglo, uh, he is a Sinophile. And he felt that, you know, he would be able to have a better deal with China by getting out of the Quad. So essentially that killed the Quad. But there were other things also in 2007, 2008, China put undue amount of pressure on India. And India became very lukewarm to the idea of Quad under Chinese influence. Also in 2008, uh, George Bush was in second term, and in 2009, President Barack Obama came. So after George Bush demitted the office, there was total lack of interest in United States in the Quad, because at that time there was a major financial crisis, and U.S. was there was a banking crisis. Uh, you know, people were losing jobs, and banks were unfolding. So Quad became totally, you know, out of fashion in the United States at that time. So in India, the UPA government at that time uh, went in great lengths to assault China that Quad had nothing to do with cooperative security and defense. It's not a defense grouping or military alliance against China. And China was quite sharp that in 2008, the Malabar naval exercises became bilateral again. In 2007, five nations participated. And in 2008, only US and India participated. Uh, Japan was not invited, Australia pulled out, and of course, Singapore didn't matter. Similarly, Australia reacted in a similar way and went out of the way to pacify Beijing. And as I said, in February, Australian foreign minister, while visiting Beijing in a major press conference, decided to announce the end of the Quad. So that was a device. 
So quad one was full of confusion. Nobody knew what it meant, whether it was a humanitarian assistant and disaster relief group, whether it was an economic grouping, whether it was a security partnership. There were a lot of birthing pains because the way it arose in emergency situation. And soon after its birth, it was orphan. So if you see these guys, one of them, this guy is Kevin Rudd, the former Prime Minister of Australia. And this guy is Wen Jiabao, who was at that time the Prime Minister of China. An interesting thing is that these guys used to speak in Mandarin because Kevin Rudd knows is a Mandarin scholar. So I call this pair as the quad killer, Kevin Rudd and Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao was the former Chinese Supreme Leader. In fact, this is a statement from Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia. Australia could find itself home alone at the Quad Party, jilted by Japan and India, and at the mercy of a capricious United States President. So that was the death nail in the coffin of Quad 1.2. Having said that, having pulled out Australia out of the quad, China and Australia remained the uneasy partners. And Kevin Rudd realized his mistake that it was not very prudent to come too close to China because China was pressurizing Australia in more than one ways. However, Kevin Rudd still maintained that quad was not to be. So let's say what happened after Quad 1. In the year 2009 to 2016, Quad remained very dominant. Shinzo Abe was Prime Minister of Japan around 2007, I think from 2005 to 2008. He came back again uh, to become, and he started to work to rejuvenate Quad again. And in 2017, when President Trump was in office, Quad became worthy of discussion again. So again, you are seeing that personalities do matter in geopolitical issues because during the Obama presidency, there was no mention of Quad. Obama actually was talking about leading from behind and was not willing to listen to any anti-China or anything that would hurt China or make China angry. So from 2007, they were working group meetings, meetings of officials. And finally, in October 2020, there was a foreign minister's meeting in Tokyo in Japan, uh, in which Mike Pompeo, the then Secretary of State, took great interest. Uh, even then, there were a lot of differences amongst the Quad members. No joint declaration was made. Each country gave up its own, gave its own declaration after the foreign minister's meeting. And people somehow were very curious what would happen when Biden administration comes. And it was a surprise that Biden administration did not take a U-turn, continued the policies of the Trump administration as far as the Quad was concerned. And of course, last Friday, March 12th, there was the first virtual Quad summit of the head of the government. And I think this was the first major summit President Biden attended or organized, organized or took the lead. So it tells you the importance of Quad for the current US administration. So Quad is back now from 2017 onwards, taking incremental and baby steps. And of course, this is from Tokyo, the four foreign ministers in the Tokyo meeting. Again, the same thing, same thing. And this was the virtual summit on March 12th. So there has been a little bit change in terminology. 
when Quad 1 started, it was called the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. At this point in time, it's not called quadrilateral security dialogue. It's being called quadrilateral framework. And I think that change is significant because it is helping the concept of quad. And of course, these are the four head of governments that were there in the quad meeting. Interesting to see Scott Morrison doing namaste. You know, in this country, the state of Alabama would not allow the yoga teachers to do namaste while doing the yoga class, if allowed at all. But in this summit meeting, Scott Morrison is doing namaste without any problems. I think there's something to Joe Biden. You know, he has a vast experience, legislative experience as a senator and of course, eight years as vice president. So uh, I think he knows what is going on in the international era. And I think it goes to his credit. Quad 2.0 is back. And what is very important that President Biden gave his 100% support on this concept. And uh, if you just give me a minute, let me see if I can resume my PowerPoint. Yes, I can. Just a minute. Can you see my screen now? <laughs> Not yet. Share the content. Okay, it should be fine now. Yeah. Okay, now you can see. So we are exactly where I left. Okay. So, of course, these are the uh, Prime Minister. Abe is no longer the Prime Minister. He resigned last year. Yoshihide Suga took his place, supported the Quad, and of course, Prime Minister Modi. And lastly, Scott Morrison, who you saw doing Namaste. So this is Quad 2.0. We no longer call it Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. We call it Quadrilateral Framework. It remains an alliance of democracies. Whether it may be enlarged or not, that's a question to be answered in future. It is multilateral and multidimensional forum. And it is going to deal with the unique challenges of Indo-Pacific community. Now, by removing that term quadrilateral security dialogue, there's a very important message being stated. And that message is that Quad is not an Asian NATO. That's very clear. In fact, this was the criticism of China of the Quad that you are creating an Asian NATO. So Quad is not an Asian NATO. What could be the future agenda for Quad? Of course, vaccine diplomacy, you all know. JNJ vaccine will be manufactured in India, funding from US and Japan, distribution by Australia and Southeast Asia. Quad is also likely to work on rare earth supply chain. Currently, China controls 60% of the rare earth production. In fact, there was a time China controlled 90% of the rare earth production. So you know, some supply chains may be created within the Quad. There'll be cybersecurity cooperation. Of course, Malabar naval exercises were there. There may be some maritime uh, cooperation with focus on humanitarian assistance because the Indian Ocean region is prone to tsunamis. 
So that is, you know, the initial experience that brought the quad together. So this is from the joint uh, statement at the end of the summit. We bring diverse perspectives and are united in a shared vision for the free and open Indo-Pacific. We strive for a region that is free, open, inclusive, healthy, anchored by democratic values and unconstrained by coercion. What does China say on Quad 2.0 virtual summit? These comments were given by Chinese spokesperson, Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson, even before the summit and says exchanges and cooperation between nations should contribute to the mutual understanding and trust amongst nations. Cooperation between countries should not target third party, imply China. We hope that relevant countries uphold the principles of openness, inclusiveness, and win-win results, should refrain from pursuing exclusive blocks and do things that are conducive to regional peace, stability, and prosperity. These comments were given by Zhao Lijian, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson. So that was the official reaction before the summit. At the same time, there were a number of articles in the Global Times. And this is a cartoon published along with an op-ed piece showing what Quad is, showing United States in the driver's seat, followed by India, Australia, and Japan. First Quad Summit. I think the critique has been scathing from China. If you rely on Global Times, which is generally Chinese government's English language mouthpiece, uh, very harsh words have been written, uh, and it is stated that India has become the, uh, you know, henchman of the U.S or cannon fodder of the US. And by joining Quad, India has lost its strategic autonomy, has become basically part of the US alliance, and will lose the goodwill of China and Russia. Further, it is stated that India has become a negative asset in the BRICS and in the SEO, and is trying to take advantage of those two groupings. So I have already said the foreign, uh, the leaders summit on March 12th announced three working groups, a vaccine initiative, climate change capacity building, and a working group on norms for emerging technologies like 5G network, artificial intelligence. Quad will also work, you know, for dealing with cyber attacks jointly, and the working groups that have been created will submit a report before the end of the year when an in-person leader summit will be organized. So what 2.0, what is the signaling going on? The first message is that China can no longer veto the foreign policies of democracies as it did successfully in 2007-2008. Number two message is that alliance of democracies will harmonize their relationships despite China's or its negative reaction. Number three is that India is an integral part of any alliance of democracies. India cannot be wished away. The next message is that U.S. must understand the domestic compulsions of the other democracies and learn to work with them so that this experiment is a success. And last signal is that a peaceful and rising India is in the interest of the entire world. Now look at some of the economic aspects. If you look at the GDP in trillion dollars for 2020, United States, there was some contraction in 2020 because of the COVID, and these are 2020 figures. US was 19.48 trillion, Japan was 4.87, India 2.65, and Australia 1.32. The combined GDP of these four countries is 28.30. I think the world GDP used to be 130 trillion. It contracted quite a bit 
in 2020. I don't know the exact figure, but these four countries have a lot of economic clout. The vaccine initiative, I think the harbinger of vaccine initiative is critique of US and Canada by the European Union, that these two countries were holding the vaccines. Actually, Canada ordered 10 times more vaccine doses than the population of Canada. And this vaccine initiative takes inspiration from India's vaccine maitri abhiyan and China's vaccine diplomacy. But it is important that Quad is taking a humanitarian issue of the pandemic, dealing with pandemic, as one of the major initiatives. Our plan, 1 billion COVID-19 vaccine dosages would be delivered by 2022. They will be funding from US Development Finance Cooperation and soft loans from Japan. They will be increasing production capacity in India, biologically limited in Hyderabad, U.S. vaccines, Novax, and J and J will be manufactured in India under stringent conditions, and logistic of shipping to Southeast Asia and beyond will be done by Australia. So look at the cooperative model. They are not doing every. All the four countries are not doing the same thing. They are pooling their talents and resources in a way that is complementary to each other, not creating the same infrastructure everywhere. So it tells you that it will create an infrastructure would be cooperative, collaborative, and will endure for future. So what does the joint statement of the leaders says? We have a shared vision for the free and open Indo-Pacific. We strive for a region that is free and open, inclusive, healthy, anchored by democratic values and unconstrained by coercion. And that has to be noted down unconstrained by coercion. We are for promoting a free and open rules based order. That is the terminology these days is RBO, rules based order, rooted in international law to advance security and prosperity and counter threats to both in Indo Pacific and beyond. The joint uh, statement acknowledges very strong support for ASEAN countries or ASEAN bloc for their unity and centrality as well as ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific and of course collaboration on the vaccine issue. In the joint statement they talk about the spirit of the Quad promoting a free open rule-based order support the rules of law freedom of navigation and overflight there's a significance of overflight. Uh, there are some air identification zones created in South China Sea uh, that creates problems. Ensure peaceful resolution of disputes, promote democratic values and territorial integrity, seek to uphold peace, prosperity, and strengthen democratic resilience based on universal values. There are a couple of items which are political in nature, like reaffirm our commitment to complete denuclearization of North Korea in accordance with United Nations Security Council resolution, and emphasize the urgent need to restore democracy in Myanmar and the priority of strengthening democratic resilience. So the spirit of Quad, our experts and senior officials will continue to meet regularly our foreign ministers will converse often and meet at least once a year. So there's an institutional mechanism being set up. Once a year, the Quad foreign ministers will meet for a conference. And the most important message was that we will hold an in-person summit by the end of 2021. And before that summit, all the working groups will submit their report. So what have been criticism of Quad. Uh, I'm quoting Tanvi Madan, who is the you know director of the India Project of Brookings Institution. So on one side, Quad is not doing enough. There was no joint statement, no military exercise, and the institutionalized lacks a purpose. On the other hand, doing too much, Asian NATO will upset China, will exclude ASEAN, unreliable partners. 
what I see from this meeting is that neither of these critiques are going to hold true anymore. The way they have, you know, moved around. So all these critiques have been sort of, you know, left to wayside. What could be the future areas of cooperation besides the ones that have been talked about? Maritime security, anti-piracy operations, you know, that Indian Ocean in 2010s and in the beginning of this uh, century, there was a lot of piracy going on in Indian Ocean. Uh, that has subsided down, but that can resurface again. Counterterrorism measures, of course, they are talking about rare production and cooperation. But one thing they have not talked about, and one thing I am identifying, that if the level of cooperation goes on, it might lead to a quad free trade area. Is there a need for quad free trade area? So you see that United States is out of CPTPP, which is Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, and RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. India is also out of those two trade agreements. Both Japan and Australia are within those two agreements. Now, United States was supposed to be in those two agreements, but because of President Trump's whatever, United States pulled out, and India was supposed to be in RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, but at the last moment in November of 2020, India pulled out because India's concerns were not being taken into consideration. So if Quad continues with the pace, there's a possibility of intra-Quad free trade agreement, which will help the economies of all those four countries, of course, they have to be sensitive to each other's needs. What is the future of Quad? People have talked about Quad Plus to involve New Zealand, Republic of Korea, Vietnam. I talked about in the beginning Quad 1.0, Quad 2.0, Quad Plus, etc. Last year, Singapore and UAE participated in the Malabar Naval Exercises, so that could be enlarged. France, UK, and Germany are now parts of freedom of nav uh, navigation operations in the South China Sea, anti-piracy -piracy, uh, operation. So people are asking questions whether there will be securitization of the Quad, and whether, again, the question is whether it will be an Asian NATO in the Indo-Pacific. So important to realize that securitization and militarization are not the same. Indeed, there will be securitization. You cannot actually be oblivious of security, but that does not necessarily mean militarization. So that distinction has to be made. Even when you are working on preventing a pandemic or taking care of pandemic, you are taking care of security. You're taking care of human security. You're taking care of economic security because if pandemic is not controlled, there will be no economic security. So there is securitization of Quad, but there's no militarization of Quad at this point in time. But there is something between the lines. On March 12th, the NSA of United States, GX Sullivan said, the Quad at the end of the day, at the end of today is now a critical part of the architecture of the Indo-Pacific. The statement is being made that Quad is here to stay. It's not going to go away. It cannot be wished away. It has become important institution to ensure rules-based order in Indo-Pacific. It has already become part of streamlined go global governance with a security architecture. Quad will not allow one party to dictate or veto the global agenda. It is a very nimble mechanism for swift and rapid action for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. It did have the experience in 2004 and 2005 in Indian Ocean tsunami. 
and it will continue with the same way by cooperating on the vaccine production for the pandemic. So eventually Quad will become a net security provider in the Indo-Pacific community. Whether you're talking about economic security or health security or whatever, that cannot be stopped. The most important message was given in 800 words in Washington Post when an op-ed was released by the four heads of governments. And basically it says our four nations are committed to a free, open, secure, and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. There's no more important signal than a joint op-ed piece by Joe Biden, Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister Suga, and Prime Minister Scott Morrison. So I'll stop here and we will have some discussion. Sorry, my computer somehow something happened and I was not able to sort of, you know, continue in between, but let's go ahead with questions and answers and discussion. So who has the first questions, please? Ramesh, you was discussing something, so I would uh, invite him to ask the question or comments. Uh, please keep the comments and questions to Quad, not other issues. Hello? Did I get it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Dityanji, uh, my name is Ramesh Kapoor. I'm the president of US India Security Council. Mm -hmm. That was started uh, during the civil nuclear deal mm -hmm. in 2005, uh, and uh, and it has progressed. What we are trying to now do is, for the last four years, uh, we're trying to uh, get India to be NATO plus six. It's NATO plus five, changing the law. It's a major defense partner. That's what we are trying to do. This year, hopefully, last year, uh, we, we, we pushed with the uh, uh, Ambassador Singla, at last we got I got him on board. We got him on board. Now my question to you is, uh, ours, ours is defense related uh, area because this law is going to be. How can we in the future work with uh, uh, with uh, after this law is passed? Of course we want to be focused. We want to make sure this law is passed this year or next year. After that, how can we work with uh, uh, the Quad? in uh, uh, getting uh, uh, them to the next level is economics now at some level it will have to be military all right uh, uh, i think you are making a good prediction and that is what i have ended with saying that quad will become a net security provider yeah. but my advice to you as well as to quad would be uh, that let's not be hasty you know, uh, and again, I'm saying Quad is not an Asian NATO. There are a lot of implications here. So let it take its own natural growth and take a step-by-step -step approach. Uh, Indo-Pacific community is a very large area and there are a lot of sensitivities. And I think we should not take a gung-ho approach. Any defense related issues can be dealt with bilaterally between the countries rather than using the institution of the Quad because the moment you bring the military alliance, there will be a negative reaction. They will not be buyout by the countries in the Indo Pacific. And those countries are important. There is an institution called ASEAN which feels that its centrality is being threatened by a Quad. So again, you know, one could do track to initiatives in the Quad framework, you know, civil society organizations meeting, discussing all that sort of thing. But let's let Quad 2.0 grow organically without bringing military alliance part of it. And yes, it may happen, but let it happen naturally rather than being forced upon. 
And this is exactly what I'm saying, the critique from China and China's attempt to, you know, create a scare, a scaremongering in the Indo-Pacific community. So you have to play your cards very well. Go on things on which there is agreement, economic, disaster relief, humanitarian assistance, alternative supply chains. I mean, real earth is a very good uh, instance of cooperation amongst the Quad countries. It has security implications. Now I can tell you in 2010, China controlled basically 97% of the production of rare earths. Rare earths are used in everything from cell phones to batteries and, you know, uh, tele, uh, uh, telecommunication equipment. And in 2010, when Japan nationalized the Senakaku Islands, China punished Japan by putting restrictions on export of rare earths to Japan. And that lead led to ninefold increase in prices of the rare earths. Over a period of time, what has happened that these four countries are developing their indigenous resources. So at this point in time, the share of China has come down from 90% to 58%. At this point in time, the United States says contributing to 28% production of the rare earth elements. Australia is producing 6% or 7%, and India is producing 1%. Majority of the rare earths are actually exported from the United States to China, and then US re-imports 80% of them after being refined. India has 6% of the deposits of rare earths in the world. So you are having this model of cooperative, you know, common, uh, collaboration in rare earth, which has security implications. So the three working groups that are going to work on climate, uh, you know, change, which is again a security issue, and also on the artificial intelligence and 5G network. These may be superficially economic issues, but they have security implications. And also they are going to work on, you know, jointly dealing with the cyber threats. Again, security implications, but let's not bring militarization of the quad at this point in time. More questions? Arun Keji, you mentioned- I'm here. Okay. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, inclusion or invitation to uh, Vietnam and South Korea, and you mentioned New Zealand. So is, is this going to happen in near future? And what advantage these countries will bring to, because relatively, as I see it, you know, uh, what sort of um, you know, strength these small countries will bring to Quad? Okay. Very good question. So we bring the issue of uh, uh, Quad Plus. I did not show this. Quad Plus. Shinzo Abe had what is called Shinzo Abe, Abe doctrine of Quad Plus by enlarging Quad, involving at least New Zealand, South Korea, and Vietnam. The problem is that these countries have their own inherent limitations. And as you know, that quad died once, you don't want it to die a second time. So we will have to wait for quad plus what may happen. And the declaration, joint declaration is very open about it, that any country that wants to cooperate with quad should continue to cooperate with quad. But before talking about enlargement of quad, or, you know, quad plus. I think it's better to consolidate quad so that it does not disappear. On case by case basis, there can be cooperation, there can be, you know, institutional framework, uh, some sort of strategic partnership. 
but to enlarge at this stage would not be a wise move. And why do I say that? As any grouping becomes bigger, decision making process becomes very unwieldy. So G20, it was thought to supposed to be panacea for giving, you know, the developing countries a voice and all, but all it becomes a talking shop. You cannot take any decisions. These four countries, these four leaders have personal rapport. They can pick up a phone and talk to each other. That situation is there. If there's a major catastrophe, major disaster, they can band together. They have the wit, the bandwidth, experience, capability. So quad plus, it's just like flying a kite. I would say that at this point in time, being a new organization, it needs to work on strengthening the organization, institutionalizing, maybe if there is a need to, you know, create a permanent secretariat. So focus has to be on institutional institution building rather than enlarging at this point in time. Aditanji, I have a question, but we are almost reaching nine o'clock. So you, you please go ahead with your question because I had to take a five minute break because my computer crashed somehow. Okay. So, so my question is that when you show the financial strength of these four countries, you know, there is no comparison. So obviously is the US is the dominating force in the quad in decision making or the other stakeholders do have some voice there? Okay, uh, you know, in one of the slides, I did mention that United States will have to understand the domestic compulsions of other democracies. It has to be a club of equals. If it is not a club of equals, it will not survive. We are living in a world which is very different from the world which we lived in the past. At this point in time, even United States is feeling difficulties. Uh, yes, US is doing domestic production of vaccine, but United States has to rely on India as the world pharmacy to you know, manufacture vaccine for Indo-Pacific countries. You know, India, unlike United States, has nimbleness at this point in time. It is becoming a manufacturing hub. Remember in, in March of 2020, India produced zero PPE. Now India is producing million PPP a day and exporting PPE, PPP kits. You know, there is a factory in Gujarat that manufactures syringes. 59,000 syringes an hour. You don't have that manufacturing capability of scale in the United States. So each of these countries are bringing strength to the table. And yes, United States is the largest one, but it will have to take a step back. And if it has to negotiate a FTA, then it will, otherwise no FTA will be negotiated. Period. So a lot will depend upon wisdom of United States, how it carries internationally in the quad format. I hope I answered the question, Professor Parter. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Any more uh, questions? Yes. Uh, this is Dinesh uh, Nilawar. OK. Um, you can hear my voice? Okay. I am part of uh, uh, here in USA, California, you know, our, um, uh, we do studies, uh, Bharat Rakshak uh, studies on uh, global geopolitics. I've written articles and also on book. And I have a YouTube channel called Bharat Kshetra, which started this year. You can mm -hmm. check it out, Bharat, double A, Bharat Kshetra. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's mainly regarding uh, India, China, and the uh, Asia continent. We have a uh, intern who is now from I am Ahmedabad who is doing that uh, show. 
So my question here is, uh, trade agreement is extremely important because the scale in which uh, China's economy is so big, which is 15 trillion, India has to catch up. It's uh, five times that. So uh, what is the plan for quad is one thing, but India, USA, India, uh, Europe, and um, India's trading agreements and India's production, scaling up the production, what are the plans? Because without that, a lot of these things don't uh, move anywhere else. So I can discuss this question offline with you. Unfortunately, the discussion today is about FAD. It's not about bilateral issues. It's not about India-China rivalry. Let's not contaminate the discussion, bringing India-China rivalry into the discussion. Quad is not an instrument by which India is going to, you know, blood in China or anything like that. That's not the impression you want to give. We can have a good discussion off the line on the issues otherwise. But, you know, apart from saying that Quad can, you know, does have economic strengths and can develop intra Quad supply chain and manufacturing. Uh, you know, alternatives, which are cheaper. Correct, correct. That's, which, that's the answer I was looking for. Good. Okay, yeah, thank you. Which are cheaper. And, you know, you see in this collaborative project on vaccine, this is the model that will have to be followed. It has to be a win, 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 win situation for all the four partners. And everyone will have to uh, contribute. So it will not be just in one direction or unilateral or, you know, from top to below. But there are production abilities and capabilities India has shown. And under the framework of part, a lot can be done. I mean, there's a question, you know, India is going to manufacture the vaccine, but there are some US sanctions on APIs. Correct. So, so US will have to lift those sanctions regarding API export, but, but it is possible that Quad will explore alternative manufacturing mechanisms and facilities rather than being, you know, bulldozed by one country that has used its cloud in a negative manner as far as one issue of rare earths is concerned. Correct, correct. Actually, another alternative uh, supply chain would be a tremendous help. Many countries would join that in a positive way, and that will increase our India's cloud. India's cloud strength will increase by the GDP, meaning increase in the overall economy at this point more than you know anything else. That is a big significant effect. But I'll be happy to discuss this with you offline. Yes, because thank my you. My discussion today is on part, not on India. I got it. Yeah, we will do that. Thank you very much. Thanks for the okay. answers. Any more questions? Uh, I just, uh, uh, this is not a question. I just want to uh, pedal my website, www.usisc. USIScouncil.org. So look up there. I think we have synergy yeah. with Quad uh, and US India Security Council. As I said, we were started in 2005 doing the civil nuclear deal. And I'm glad you're doing this uh, program. Uh, and uh, uh, so look at our website, see how we can help each other. Thank you very much, Mr. Kapoor. Your yeah. Offer is graciously accepted. We shall work in collaboration. Actually, I met you before. You probably don't remember. I think so. I think in one of the, was it one of the uh, congressional lunch, the dinner or something? Uh, something like that. There was an event organized by Devin Verma. Yes, yes, yes. The yes, sidelines yes. of that we had met. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. So if there are no more questions, we can call it a day. But if there is one last question, I am happy to. Sorry.
Yeah. There is somebody asking a question. I I don't think so. Uh, Aditanji, uh, Surendra ji, you don't you want to ask anything? No, no, no. Thank you. Maybe next time you know, I'll uh, thank you. It has been very very useful and uh, you know very informative uh, to me. You know. So yeah, I appreciate. Thank you so much, Aditanji. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot everyone for joining. Uh, it was small, uh, a number of participants, but small and sweet. And sorry that my computer actually crashed in between and I had to restart that. But we were able to, within five minutes, restart and nothing was lost. And you did have, you know, full exposure to all the slides and discussion. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Namaste, everyone. Good night. Namaskar.